Good morning, uh, Cookville in Tennessee Tech. Okay, so this is the first of our recorded lectures for steam power plants, and this is the beginning of our thermodynamic review of the Rankine cycle. So without further ado, let's put this on presentation mode. There we go. Okay, so this probably doesn't look like anything you saw in Thermo 1 or Thermo 2, but this is uh, a TVA Kingston steam plant. When you drive to Knoxville, you see the stacks on the side of the road, about exit 350 to 352. You have several glimpses. Uh, this sits on Watts Bar Lake, which is the source of the cooling water that's pumped into the condenser. Um, so this is the steam cycle and I thought we'd take a look at it because this is the level of detail, the level of complexity that we're interested in operating at this and even in more components and more complexity than this, but this is uh, a good starting point. So just to walk our way around this a little bit, over here is a boiler. And that's a little fuzzy. What is that? 88.6% efficiency they're showing. Burning coal, pulverized coal. They take coal and ground it up into the consistency of face powder and then blow it through coal pipes in the burners where they're also blowing hot combustion air. And they fire it out tangentially from the corners of the boiler from a form a swirling fireball that uh, then uh, is in the furnace portion of the boiler that uh, transfers heat into the boiler tubes where the steam is uh, generated. Uh, steam goes to a steam drum where the saturated steam is separated and then it flows on through different superheaters and uh, reheater tubes as we will uh, see in depth and detail in later portions of the course. Uh, I might note, if I can get my little pointer back here. Uh, come on, baby. Well, not wanting to come back. There it is. Okay, so um, these are the design values for the plant. This is KW 149,746 KW which is perilously close to one and a half or 150 megawatts. Auxiliary power to run the cycle. Net plant generation is this. And heat rate is efficiency, the way the power industry states it. So it is, uh, this is 9,367 BTUs input into the cycle uh, in order to generate a kilowatt hour, a net kilowatt hour. So that's kind of like one over an efficiency, an efficiency with units, but you can, you, know, you should think about that. So lower is better in terms of heat rate. If I make it more efficient, then this 93 might go down to 9,200 BTUs an hour of heat input from the fuel to generate a kilowatt hour. <clears throat> Symbols you can see, um, you know, density, uh, the degree symbol is Fahrenheit, H is enthalpy BTUs per pound, and the number sign is pounds per hour, a solid line is water, and a dashed line is steam. So this is a pretty nice diagram. So we see um, here is my main steam coming out of the boiler, and you see the conditions. It's uh, 1815 PSIA. So it's 1800 PSIG, and they're allowing 15 for the atmospheric pressure, 14.7 rounded, and 1,000 degrees with an enthalpy of 1480.3 BTUs per pound. Coming out here, rolling into my high pressure turbine. Um, and this is, so these, uh, this is an exit, this number one. This is an extraction. So these turbines have extraction ports along the way where we actually pull steam out at different pressures and take it typically to feed water heaters where we are boosting 
the temperature of the feed water before it is reintroduced into the boiler. So we can see this number one is operating at uh, 625 PSIA. And we come down here. This is the uh, steam flow, 47,710 pounds per hour, uh, 719 degrees and 1360.6 BTUs per pound flowing into this feed water heater, which is just basically a shell and tube, a large shell and tube heat exchanger. And we show the, um, the, the temperature of the feed water in and the temperature of the feed water out. So we're uh, 446.2 in and come up here. This is the flow rate, by the way, a million two hundred or a million twelve thousand, some change uh, pounds per hour, and we're 485. So we're picking up uh, what 40, a uh, little less than 40 degrees through this feed water heater. Okay. Uh, let's see. So this is the uh, let's see. This is the pressure uh, enthalpy and all this. And then we're we're coming out. So basically, this uh, 4710 goes in at this condition. It comes out at liquid at uh, 456.2 at this enthalpy. So this difference in enthalpy is basically, uh, except for losses from this, which are pretty small. They should be insulated pretty well. Most of that energy goes into the feed water, and then the condensate flows backward to the next uh, lower pressure heater. Uh, I lost my pointer again. Um, so the number two heater takes extraction from the number two port uh, at 450 and operates at uh, 427.5. There we go, got it back. So here's the number two extraction. And we're coming down through here. And so this is 82,260, these conditions. And so this just keeps going. We keep you know, the boosting the feed water temperature. This is the last or the highest pressure heater. And they go down in pressure and temperature. Um, and so the condensate flows just because of pressure difference. We don't need to pump it so long as we go back because I have a higher pressure here than I have here. I have a higher pressure here than I have here. Okay, so that just flows by pressure. So this condensate enters this heater, this steam condenses. And so, so we have the sum of the 82,280 plus the 47,710 coming out right here. And you see that condensate flows continue to build uh, as it passes through more and more uh, feed water heaters. Okay, back to the, this is the high pressure turbine, this is the intermediate pressure turbine, and we have two low pressure turbines uh, on this cycle. Um, so we have the number one extraction, the number two extraction, and then the rest of that steam, so then goes back to the boiler for a reheating. And so you can see the difference between this and this, uh, is the extraction steam and perhaps sometimes there's a little sealing steam that's taken off to uh, go to the steam seals. Um, let's see, I'm going to do this because I can keep my pointer. I'll blow it up a little bit. We'll move around here. I think this will be acceptable to you. I hope so. So we'll come on. Whoops, went too far. Let's try this one more time. There we go. Okay, so I think this will work a little bit better. Okay, so this is the reheat steam flowing back. It goes into the boiler through the reheat tubes, picks up temperature. So let's see, we are showing um, uh, 640.2 here, and it's the same flow, but we're now we've boosted the temperature to a thousand degrees uh, and a pressure has dropped 40 psi so you see we're 450 here and we're only 405 here so this is this is real cycle stuff you know this isn't um 
you know, the little ideal problems you had in thermo. This is what really happens out there in the world. If you're going to flow steam through these long pipes and through uh, tubes to reheat it in the boiler, you're going to have some pressure loss, some real pressure loss. Okay, so we come back to what they call the interceptor valve, which uh, is the input control valve to the IP turbine. And so this steam is going to enter the IP. It starts flowing through generating. <clears throat> so we're coming in at 405. When we drop to, whoops, uh -oh, that wasn't good. <laughs> Maybe I should uh, make sure I put that back where it was. There we go. When we drop to, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger again. Okay, we can move around as we need to. Okay, so when I drop to 190 PSI, A, I encounter the third extraction, and it's feeding uh, steam, uh, let's see, to this, the number three feed water heater, and also uh, an evaporator, an evap right here, which is coming in. And let's see, I'm not real sure where this feeds from, to be honest with you. Um, I've never paid much attention to this. Um, at any rate, but it's receiving uh, 21,000. Uh, so we see that the number three, where's the number three extraction here? Well, at this point, it's, uh, this is uh, 50,520 going uh, into the number three. And I've got another 21,000 going into this ABAP. I'll have to do some research and figure out what that is. I forget right now. Um, okay, and so the rest of the steam continues through the turbine uh, till we get to a number four extraction. And this guy is feeding this feed water heater, which looks a little bit different. So what we're going to see here, this is, this is called the de-aerator. <clears throat> And this uh, is an open feed water heater where the steam and the water actually touch each other. And it's uh, for more than just heating the feed water, it's for stripping off any uh, oxygen, nitrogen, any non condensable gases <clears throat> uh, that uh, might be present. So that's why it's called a de aerator. So you see D E A E R here. And uh, it's also called in the thermal book an open feed water heater. So all of this condensate is being dumped in here. Uh, this feed water is being dumped in here and uh, steam that condenses uh, is also being dumped in here. And then we have to vent uh, a little bit of steam. So this is a vent line that's going up into this uh, evap. And so what's happening, I guess, is this is condensing. Oh, this this must be makeup water. That must be makeup water. Because see, it's 70 degrees and it's water. So that's that's makeup water that's coming in. And we're dumping the uh vent, uh the DA vent in this thing. We're putting in uh this amount of steam to heat it, and then we're dumping all this back into the deariator. That's what that is. Okay. Well, you go over this thing enough times, you you find stuff you hadn't really thought about before. So anyway, moving on along, just in our, this may not be too quick, but you know we're going to talk through this. Um, okay, so there's two LP turbines, and so this is what's called the crossover. So, uh, and they're actually opposed flow. One flows in one direction, the other flows in the other direction to balance the axial thrust on the shaft. But we'll see that later. Uh, at any rate, uh, they we, we have extractions out of the LPs. We see we've got uh, uh, number five, number six, and number seven. These are feeding. Uh, these guys are feeding additional closed feed water heaters seven, there's five, so four gets fed there. So it's kind of the same stuff going on. It's just the temperature of the feed water is coldest on this end and gets hotter as we go uh, towards the number one heater. Uh, 
all of the steam gets dumped into the condenser. Uh, this is the, the turbine shaft that the generator is shown here. So that's uh, all of the turbine shafts bolt together and then um, <clears throat> the generator bolts on that. So the turbines turn the generator. We're getting almost 150,000 kW. Uh, we're showing, well, we're showing the shaft power. That's interesting. That would give us the uh, generator efficiency on this guy. Let's see. So we're, what, we're 149,746 divided by 150. Two one one two. So that generator is ninety eight point four four percent efficient. So that's the difference between the shaft power and the KW out. Okay. Then we see we've got uh, four hundred thirty five thousand eight twenty pounds per hour of steam exiting the low pressure turbines. The enthalpy is ten forty point seven BTUs per pound. Condenser pressure. Um, is, well, let's see, I take it back. That's not, that's only out of this turbine. Here's the exhaust out of the other turbine and they're mixing together. Uh, so we're getting what looks like a total condenser flow of 670, uh, 1,950. Okay. Uh, the condenser pressure is two inches uh, of mercury absolute, which is about one uh, PSIA. Uh, and so this is under a fairly hard vacuum. If atmospheric pressure is 14.7, then we're like minus 13.7, or, or is it, it's 0.1. No, it's one. So yeah, about 13.7 PSIA uh, negative. Uh, so anyway, uh, so the, 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 the heat that's condensed, because we're coming out of here, uh, this shows the flow out. We've got some additional small injection, I guess. But um, So we're going from 1040.7 BTUs per pound to 69.1. So that's a huge energy difference, and that's all of that steam. Most of the steam coming, or the, the exit coming out of these low-pressure turbines, it has a little bit of water in it. It's wet but the vast majority is steam and it has to be condensed. And so uh, this diagram doesn't show water, but we're taking lake water and we're pumping it through this. So it may come in at 60, 65 degrees, whatever in the, in the summer, maybe 50, 52 in the winter, and it's being heated up uh, to take that heat back and dump it in Watts Bar Lake. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we come on down. So uh, basically, this is my feed water flow. Uh, I've got a pump here. I'm pumping down, and uh, this is a, this is a condensate flow that's being pumped into the line. If you look, this is uh, the extraction flow into this number number seven heater is thirty nine thousand five forty. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. What is that? I got the wrong number here. It's uh, 32,860, 32,860. So this is the condensate out of the bottom of this heater being pumped up into this line uh, with the rest of the feed water. And so off it goes on its merry way for feed water heating. Um, this is a flash tank. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're taking condensate out of this, and this is hooked into this heater, so it's gonna operate at this pressure. So it's gonna generate some flash steam that we're gonna put it in over here and use it. And then the liquid is gonna be pumped up into this line. So this is getting the condensate uh, out of some of these other heaters. Um, cycled back into the uh, feed water. We don't, we don't want to throw it away. You don't want to throw away any feed water that you don't have to. Um, so that's a pretty good walk around the system for now. I mean, we're going to go back in much more depth and detail uh, as we get further into the material in the course.
So let's move on. And this one, I don't think I'm even going to talk through right now. Uh, this is the 200 megawatt unit. It's doing a lot of the same things. It just has now we're up to, uh, what is that, seven? We have eight feed water heaters, and it's a bigger cycle. Our steam production is a million. Well, let's see, main steam is here. Is that right now? Main, that's right here. Yeah, main steam's here. A million two hundred and eighty-seven thousand pounds an hour going over here. <clears throat> yeah, I believe that's right. Yeah, this is the high pressure turbine, so that's the main steam flow right here. There's your reheat steam, feed water heaters, condenser. You know, generally it just picked up a little more complexity. It's a little bit larger unit. Okay. So let's see, we'll take that down a little bit. Now let's let's move on. Okay, so there's some comments here. Um, I'll make that a little bigger. So this was 2014. I probably should update it. Uh, but you've seen in, in the class in our initial discussion that uh, what some of the, I guess, 2017 is the most recent that we have numbers for. So you've got some kind of an idea. I think I remember coal was down to like 30, 32, 33%. Natural gas is now larger. Uh, nuclear wind is up to six, six and a half. Uh, solar is up to about two to three. So renewables are expanding. Coal shrinking. Gas is expanding. Nuclear may be down a little bit. Nuke plants, if you can run them, you run them pretty much, because the fuel's relatively inexpensive, and there's absolutely zero emissions, so as long as it's a good day at the plant, nothing breaks. You know, hydro, same way, so you want to maximize this stuff, and the wind and the solar as best you can, and you got natural gas and coal, which are still huge, uh, making up a lot of the difference. Uh, and then, so, a comparison here between, um, uh, the different energy sources. Uh, it's a little hard to read. I think this is this shows gas expanding, coal shrinking, uh, nuclear relatively the same, and of course renewables growing. So that's pretty similar information. Okay. So let's see. All right, so now we'll get into the actual thermal slides. And I will say that uh, this, this thermal authors do have a bit of a philosophical vent that comes out a little bit here, but that's okay. We can handle that. Uh, to meet our national power needs, there are challenges related to declining uh, economically recoverable supplies of non-renewable, you know, but again, we have fracking and the recent uh, uh, increases in uh, uh, oil production. The U.S. now leads the world. So, yeah, take some of this stuff with a grain of salt. Things change. Technology changes, and all of a sudden, uh, it's not exactly the same uh, uh, world that uh, it used to be. Uh, certainly, global climate change uh, and environmental issues are on the front burner, uh, and uh, that stuff is heavily debated. Um, but renewables are certainly, for all kinds of reasons, um, you know, continuing to expand, and and I think that's that's good for everybody. Uh, it does cause issues, stability issues on the grid, and things that we've mentioned a little bit that we'll talk about more as we go through the course. Uh, rapidly expanding demand for power. That's not true in the U.S. Our power demand, as we've seen, is flat and is even in some, some years in the last four or five has even declined a little bit. Now, if you look at China, oh my goodness. Well, they can't build power plants fast enough in China. They build everything. They build coal. They build nuclear. They build natural gas related. I mean, you just can't, uh, they just can't get enough electrical power in China. There's so many people and the economy is developing rapidly. And so there, that's, that's where the growth is in a lot of lesser developed countries. I would say in Europe, uh, Great Britain, uh, the UK, uh, Japan, uh, the US, you probably see power flat, potentially even decreasing because uh, 
as new energy conserving technologies uh, uh, come online, the uh, uh, the demand is offset by the increases in efficiency. Uh, we're still heavily dependent on coal and natural gas and nuclear, all of which are non-renewable, and that is certainly true. So, I mean, when you look at coal, natural gas, go back up here. Coal, well, 39, let's say, let, let's use the numbers that, that I remember from that uh, 2017 EIA data. I think coal was about 33. Uh, natural gas, I'm thinking, is probably up around uh, uh, 35, maybe even more than that, but that's 68. Nuclear uh, is about 19. That, that's 87% of our energy. <laughs> so, you know, this uh, situation is not going to uh, completely switch anytime soon. Okay. Uh, well, you know, coal, natural gas, nuclear continue to play roles, wind power, solar, all that's expected to increase. And yeah, we've seen that. Um, and you can look at uh, the thermodynamic cycles that we use, whether it's renewable or not. Um, and so non-renewable source, yes. Uh, oil is not a big deal as we've seen. Uh, so natural gas itself is uh, a Brayton cycle, which usually in power generation gets teamed with the Rankine cycle, as we'll see. So Rankine cycles uh, dominate a lot of it. Uh, hydro, it just falls through a turbine. Wind, you know, turns a windmill, photovoltaic, it's like semiconductor material. Uh, fuel cells, um, it's a little bit of a different, you know, kind of a, a chemical type reaction and, you know, current tidal power, that sort of thing, it pushes something back and forth as the tides roll in and out. Uh, so we're going to look at our uh, four basic components. Um, uh, alternative vapor power plant configurations are going to be shown. Um, so let's take a look at this. Uh, well, this is kind of our basic ranking cycle. He, he groups them together. Um, you know, we can have fossil fuel uh, pressure water reactors concentrating uh, solar thermal plants where the concentrating collectors focus on a power tower where the steam is produced are geothermal plants. Uh, they're all vapor power plants, working fluid is vaporized and condensed. So that's the terminology. Vapor power plants means that the working fluid is condensed. Uh, key difference among the plants is the uh, origin of the energy required to vaporize the working fluid. Uh, organic Riken cycle typically takes waste heat or geothermal because it's a relatively low temperature, but we'll talk more about that. Okay, so um, here's uh, kind of a diagram of the cycle uh, in general terms, not complicated like uh, the TVA plants. So we've got a boiler, which uh, we typically have some kind of uh, fuel input. We, if, we're, if we're, you know, if we have combustion, you know, if we're gonna burn, then uh, we're gonna have to have air to support the combustion activity. Then heat gets transferred into the working fluid. So this would be a feed water pump, pumping basically probably slightly subcooled water in here. And then it vaporizes, we make high temperature, high pressure steam. Uh, we have losses. Uh, so the combustion gases, you know, the air and the fuel come in relatively cold and the, the products of combustion are hot. Uh, and they go up the stack and that takes energy with them. And so that's, that's the major loss on the boiler. Typically it's at least 10%. In some cases it's larger. Uh, we also have emissions that we, we've talked about and we'll mention more. Uh, steam goes into a turbine. Turbine drives an electric generator, basically an electric motor. It's being turned in reverse and the power comes out. Come out of the turbine, we still have very low pressure, but we have um, a lot of steam. And anytime there's steam present, you're carrying a lot of energy with it. So roughly 
uh, 30%, 40% of the input energy and the fuel is dumped in the condenser. It's a huge, that's where a vast majority of the waste heat goes into the condenser. So we're going to take uh, some kind of cooling water. This could, this could come out of a lake. If we don't have a lake, we can put a cooling tower and we're going to pump it through the condenser to, we have to condense this working fluid, this steam, so we can get it back to the boiler. And then if we have a cooling tower, this has to, we have to dump this waste heat to the air, or if it's a lake, we dump it to the lake. Um, we can put in some makeup water and then this fit into a pump. So basically that's what the vapor power plant looks like. At the, now we're getting into the more simplified scale that we see uh, uh, in the thermal books. Okay, nuclear plants, well, what changes? Well, what changes is we get rid of the boiler and now we have some kind of a nuclear reaction going on that does nothing but produce heat, hopefully. Hopefully we control it and it doesn't melt anything down. But, you know, that's, that's what the control rods do. They can moderate the rate of the nuclear reaction. So we produce the amount of steam that we need based on the amount of electricity we need to get out of the plant. And so uh, this is just a pressurized loop that we're going around and uh, um, we boil it off here, we condense it here, we put it in a pump, we pump it in over here, and we just keep making steam in this loop. Okay, and of course, that, uh, that circulates uh, into our, there. this is just our boiler, our steam generator. And so then we still have to have a condenser. The, the rest of the cycle is uh, the same. We go into a turbine, we come out low pressure, mostly vapor. We have to condense it. We have to have a lake or a cooling tower. And then this is condensate that gets pumped back in and uh, has to be revaporized re again. And this loop has some kind of a working fluid that just circulates around uh, in a circle to is the heat source for the boiler. Uh, the pressures change a little bit and there are some, there, you know, uh, the numbers change a little bit, but the, the general theory of the Rankine cycle, all of this stuff, it's all doing the same job as we had before. Okay. And then we can have, uh, they call them solar thermal or uh, vapor, uh, uh, solar vapor power plant, whatever terminology you like. And so this one, we put all these mirrors with heliostats that track the sun, and they usually put this, put the boiler up on a big tower, and then they focus all of the sun's rays up on, up on the outside of the boiler, and that causes it to heat, which generates uh, a high temperature. A lot of times it's a molten salt that they dump the heat into on this side. They get it hot enough, you can pump it, and it goes through this side of a heat exchanger. And so this is really the boiler. The heat source comes in, it gets cooled down a little bit and it goes back for more heat. And the condensate comes in, comes out as steam and the rest of this stuff is the same. The difference is the only fuel input is from the sun out here being reflected uh, to make this hot so that this can generate steam and drive our cycle. So in very uh, rudimentary terms, that's what the, uh, 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 the, a solar thermal power plant looks like. It looks like the same except for how we get the energy to make the steam. Okay, so this would be a geothermal plant. And uh, so, you know, it's the same kind of a deal. Uh, we're just, uh, we're pulling heat, either uh, hot water or steam, uh, depends where we are and what we have available but we're pulling it out of the ground, putting it through a heat exchanger, and this is vaporizing a working fluid. Uh, typically, we can't get nearly as much temperature and pressure uh, here as we need to use water as the working fluid. So that would require us to use a different working fluid. So a lot of times these are hydro uh, uh, refrigerants or uh, different, um, 
compound, different fluids that will vaporize at a lower pressure. You know, and that's that's the reason. Other than that, water would be used if possible, but we just can't get enough temperature to make it as economical as we can using um, some other fluid here. Um, and so, like I said, a lot of some some refrigerants are good at this because they have low boiling uh, temperatures. Okay, so we're going to, it's divided into these major subsystems uh, in terms of analysis. And so for most of our uh, systems, uh, water will be the working fluid. Okay, so system A provides heat transfer, uh, you know, to vaporize water circulating in subsystem B. So this is, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I really like the way he divides this stuff up in these slides, but uh, anyway, so this is where the fuel's being combusted and then we're transferring heat from here into here and we got a loss coming up there. So then his subsystem B is just, you know, the steam generation, the turbine, the condenser and the pump, which is really the nuts and bolts of the Rankine cycle. Uh, so we've talked about that. I think we're pretty good on that. And subsystem C, that's, we put shaft power, we turn this generator and we get electricity out the backside. Uh, at a real plant, we have to cool this stuff, uh, typically hydrogen. Hydrogen gas is used to cool the electric generator. The most large electrical generating stations uh, has superior transport properties. And of course it's combustible, so it's a pain in the rear if this stuff gets loose. Uh, has caused fires in the past, but that's, that is, and then this is the heat rejection side of it, the condenser, uh, cooling tower, lake, whatever, um, removes energy that we have to, because we can't, there's no way you can afford to throw away the steam or, there's, or, or the water. You have to preserve the water. We've got some chemicals in it. We've done some water treatment on it, that sort of thing. And so we just have to condense it because you can't, you can't pump that vapor. It would, it would take compressors and all that sort of thing. It is just not practical to do that. So we have to condense it. Uh, let's see. Each unit of mass of water periodically undergoes the cycle. And uh, so in system B, and that cycle is what's known as the Rankine cycle. And that's fundamental, as you saw earlier, to many, many of our power generation technologies utilize the Rankine cycle. Okay, I think this is a good place to uh, stop this. I don't like these to get so big. So I'm going to stop, post this one, and then we will continue on this slide here shortly. Thank you.